before we start, like how many of you here are even aware of product management or you are a product owner? Great. So this is something that I saw or I read in CIO.com. Uh, this is a story about a farmer who is farming his land one sunny fine morning and uh, suddenly he sees this balloon comes over from nowhere and he's like, whoa, what is that? And this balloon comes right up to him and then the guy in the balloon is shouting at him and telling, can you help me? Do you know where I am? And the farmer says, yeah, you are right above my ground, 200 feet above my ground. So the guy on the top says, you must be in IT. You gave me a technically correct answer, but it doesn't help me. And the farmer then says, you must be the product guy. Because you don't know where you came from. You don't know where you're going. You're over my land. You're asking me to help you. <laughs> right? That's, that's, that's a classic situation in traditional big organizations. And that's uh, very symptomatic of, uh, I would not say failure, but very symptomatic of slow progress in general. Uh, so what you do is, that's the reason I think the people who raise their hands as product managers or they're working in product management, uh, I think that's a very, very important job. It's like that white sky there, you bridge the gap between the farmer and the balloon up there. You guys are the people, the conduit to talk between business and IT. And uh, this is, I think most of all of us are familiar with this, uh, that product management sits in the center, works with development, executives, talks with marketing, and sometimes if product management is marketing, they talk with different customers directly. And then you report up to executives and you uh, do your budgets and targets and stuff, right? Product management, uh, this is one guy who is really talks about how to become agile in product management, uh, Rich Mironov. But this is something that you guys already understand, right? Now look at these products. These are all failed products in 2011. Uh, if any one of you do not know about anyone in particular, you can tell me which one. Just, and there is no shame in not knowing. I didn't know all of them before I made this presentation. So, Anyone in particular that draws your attention? Go ahead. Circuit City. Fine. Anyone else? Anything else? Which one? The that's not the Beetle. Borders, okay. So I will just touch on uh, the Fiat 500. That's not a Beetle, that's a Fiat 500. Uh, borders and Circuit City, right? Uh, so Fiat 500, when they launched in the US, they said they are going to sell 50,000 cars in one year. Uh, they sold about roughly 2,500 or something like that. Uh, so I think it's a big failure. They didn't test the market like where they're going because in the US, nobody likes small cars. Uh, the last success was Vittel and a BMW Mini. Uh, borders. Great bookstore, uh, great place to go, sit down, have your coffee, read books, find books, uh, meet new people. But they never capitalized on that. They, ne they never came to the point where they realized that Amazon is their real competition or they never forged a contract with publishers to say that you have exclusive deals. They never had a business plan on what to do next. Barnes & Noble is still surviving. They're still doing better than what Borders right now is completely dissolved. They have only their reader. The Kobo ebook reader is their only product right now, and they have dissolved. Circuit City. Circuit City was mainly used by people who would do things in their home by themselves, like people who would create like a ham radio, or people who would do, create like a home smoke alarm kit within their, by themselves. Like it's like a DIY do-it-yourself kit for a place, and there is so much competition for Circuit City on the internet that they cannot just have the stores across the US. They just need, they couldn't support the whole infrastructure of doing that. Uh, that's pretty interesting. I, one of the other things that I really find interesting is that movie, uh, Mars Meet Needs Moms. Uh, that's a very interesting movie. They've spent about, I think, $170 million in making that movie, and they made $17 million, and that's it. So what's wrong with these guys, right? Like, there's nothing wrong. These are, these are all big corporations. Uh, they really have the money, and uh, they have talented workforce. Uh, Microsoft Keen spent $1.2 billion on Microsoft Keen, and they were there for 48 days, less than Kim Kardashian's marriage. Uh, so, like, what, what's wrong with them? I mean, that's the question that you need to ask. And, uh, but on the contrary, if you look at this, 
I think it's a product management failure. I mean, you, you can call it marketing failure, you can call it execution failure, but at the end of the day, it's a product failure because your product didn't succeed in the market, right? But look at this. So there is a huge demand for product people. This is just for US, okay? This is not across the globe. This is just for US. There's a huge demand for product people who can take these ideas, really simple ideas, and turn them into really good products and make good business, good ecosystems. Like something like, um, it's, it comes up so pretty often that it becomes like a cliche, like iTunes, like it's a new ecosystem. Who is a product manager? Anyone, somebody who said who has five years of experience, uh, who is a product manager? Tell me a definition of who is a product manager. One, one attribute, other than, I mean, that guy has a ring and he has a receding hairline like me, but other than that, who is a product manager? Okay. Do you know an example? How, how does iPhone make you successful? So it uh, helps me do all my stuff very easily. I can, it's a nice extra. I have so many apps, so it has got... Okay, so it made app developers successful and you are using those apps. So that's a good definition. Good. Anyone else? So you won't get, so you'll get all the blame also when it fails. <laughs> okay. So product manager for me is uh, a product successful is team success. If a product is failure, it's product manager. Okay. So this is a Wikipedia definition, right? Who investigates, selects, and develops one or more products. But the key thing that I find important is that it generates business benefit to the organization. I think that's what the key part is. Like, so everybody then can be a product manager within the organization because I am working within an organization to provide benefit to my organization. If my organization is there, my job is there. If it's not there, my job is not there. Uh, have you guys seen this before? Like, this is pretty common. If you Google, like, this is pretty common, a pragmatic marketing framework. Uh, this guy, is a, this company runs this framework and it says, what are the tasks that a, project man a product manager needs to do? And they divide it on a scale, a continuum scale, from strategic to tactical. And if you can see that there are some stuff, I'm sorry to pull you guys here because it's nearer to me than that one. Uh, there are some stuff which seems like a development perspective, like creating user persona scenarios, release milestone, launch plan, uh, success stories, innovation, and then there are some stuff which are very strategic, market research, market sizing, business case, pricing. Uh, then there is like channel training, collateral sales and tools. And no one person can do this. No one person can do all of this unless it's a very small company and you just have like a very small product. Uh, so they say like divide it up into three different parts. Uh, hire someone who is more strategy focused, give him the lead, and then have someone who is like a development product manager who builds the product and then there is someone in the sales and marketing channel who kind of goes and sells the product, comes back with the feedback and things like that. But they all belong to the product management team. So that, that's a model that they provide. You need not follow that, but usually it works out pretty well. Okay. Okay. This is pretty simple slide, right? But it's pretty straightforward slide, that it's a continuous process. You do not have uh, one launch and you do not say that it's done. Even if you have a simple website, uh, let's say a blog, even if you have your own blog and you are basically branding yourself, then you cannot say that I have published a content last month and that is the end of it, right? I'm, I'm, I need to keep myself and my content updated so that people know that I am there, my brand is established, people come and look at my slides, they look at my content. So it's a continuous process. And monitoring and listening is one of the key things because you need to know what people are talking about. I'll give you an example. Uh, four years back, we worked with a publishing house called Simon & Schuster. Uh, they are, I think, the second largest publishing house in the world in English. And they have tremendous amount of content in their like inventory, and around that time, a celebrity died. Uh, and they wanted to come into the content, like Huffington Post was their competitor, so they wanted to come in, come and provide some content which will drive traffic to their site. And so that's where it is. They were constantly monitoring, like what's the market 
pulse, what's the latest news that's happening, and they would depend on the news cycle to put their content out there so that when you do a Google search on that celebrity, their site will come up first. And Huffington Post does it the best. We'll talk about all this later. All the blue things, we'll talk about them. Okay, so to do this, you need to be this, right? Uh, when I take this slide, where usually in the US, they do not understand what does it mean. I mean, but it's a pretty, it is a pretty intuitive thing. Like it's a god of destruction, a god of creation, and a god of nurturing, right? So you have to do that continuously. Where you, if you have a portfolio or multiple products or multiple features, you need to kill some features. You need to have new features, and you need to nurture those which are making money and progress for you or giving business benefit to the organization. So you need to literally behave like a god, which is really hard work. So that was product management. Uh, surprisingly, Agile doesn't speak anything about product management. It speaks of a product owner who helps, who sits down with the developers, writes stories, and uh, helps in prioritization. Right, which is which is the surprising part of Agile, and uh, but this guy Jeff Patton uh, used to be my colleague, but makes a lot of money more than me right now, so he left the company because he makes more money independent. Uh, he said, and he's pretty famous, uh, that product owners are people who make decision about what the product should do while taking into account the people who make the buying decisions actually want. And this kind of definition you will not find in a Scrum manual or an Agile manual. But I like his definition because I think it's not dogmatic. It's very pragmatic. He's telling actually what a product owner needs to do. It's not about just sitting down with the developer, writing a user story, managing a backlog. It's much more than that. I'm going to ask a question to people who raise uh, their hands when they said they are product managers. Act as a customer for developer questions. Uh, anyone? What, what, why did I, I, like, I made that thing bold, the customer. What do, what do you mean by a customer as a product manager? The end user? The end user? Who takes decision of buying? Great. Uh, I cannot hear you, can you tell me loudly. Anything, anyone who has anything to do with the product is a customer. I'll give you an example. How many of you have kids? Okay, when you buy something for your kid, who is the customer? You or the kid? So my definition of customer is very simple. Anyone who pays the money for the service is the customer. Uh, so if I'm a consultant and I'm going to a client side, if the client pays money for my services, then they are my customer. Whatever they are building and they're giving it to someone else, they are their customers. My direct customer at any point in time is whoever is paying me the money, right? So from a, like when you buy a toy for the kid, you look at the age, like it's for five to eight years old, it does not contain uh, BPA, it's safe for the kid, even if he ingests it, like whatever, right? You look for multiple things. I don't have a kid, so I don't know exactly what you look for, but I hope that people would look for those things as parents. The kid doesn't care about that. You are the customer because you are making the decision. Go ahead. You are right on the money, right? So it depends on the product that you are making. So if you are making a milk bottle, right, that you use to feed your kid, you are making the decision. But if you are buying a ball, then probably the kid is making the decision. Uh, rest of the stuff, I think, is coming from the agile world. And I necessarily do not agree with all of that because I personally feel that a product owner or a product manager need not do all that stuff. The team can, the team can do release planning. The team can uh, elaborate user stories if they have enough knowledge about it. The team can plan iterations. The, it's not the product owner's responsibility to do all that. Uh, but since we are agile, the expectation is that a product owner will do this. I, 
que no era necesario. Exactly, right? That's the question. Why you pay money for the product owner? And if you go back to that slide where I said a product owner or a project ma or a product manager's responsibility is completely different, his or her responsibility is to build a product that will give competitive advantage to the company on a sustainable basis. That's that's the core. If I know how to build a product, I'm I'm going to build that. I'm not care about. I do care about release planning, but I do not need to own it. I should not be held responsible or to the gun because I didn't show up in a sprint planning meeting. The business analyst should be able to do that if he or she has enough context of it. There are product owners here I know who would do the same thing. I mean, I'm looking at Jennifer. <laughs> So what has happened is basically with Agile, the expectations has been reset about what product management people need to do. Uh, and I'm not telling that these are all bad things, these are actually good things, but this adds on to your responsibility of what a true product management team or a manager would actually do. I'm not telling that you do not need to do this. If you have the time and the bandwidth to do this, do it. You're more than welcome to do it. You have more ownership, you have more sense of the product, you have more, uh, context of the product, so do all this, do, uh, how does this work? Uh, do like, instead of review docs, do inspect the code. I mean, instead of relying on the QA, do frequent inspection. I mean, do by yourself, but if you do not have the time and the bandwidth to go and talk to your users and find what they want and what they do not want, then this is a waste. I think I have a pause. There you go. Questions? Yeah. No, it's not. He should be able to communicate that to everyone else, yes. 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 Correct. Correct, correct. So that becomes a very good example for products that everyone uses. Let's say, uh, I'll use another bad example, it's a cliched example, Facebook. Uh, for Facebook, the people who are developing the code, the engineers, are actually the users of Facebook, so they know what features they actually want. And that, that is the way they collectively prioritize. So there is a product team who does the prioritization. There is no single person who says, I want this. Mark Zuckerberg doesn't say, I want this feature, so it's going to be there. It's, it's not like that. Ooh. Microsoft. So that was all about product management and agile. Uh, how many of you re read the what you call that, the abstract that was provided in the, uh, what do you call this, the pamphlet that these guys gave you, uh, like about this session and how many of you read it online because there were a lot of reviews and comments that went on the thread for this particular session. And uh, one of the things that I actually said, they asked me repeatedly, who is the audience? Who is the audience? Who, who should attend this uh, session? And uh, should established product managers come to this session? And I said, if they come to the session, they will go back and resign. Uh, I said, like, if new product owners come to this session, they will actually go back and enhance. Or, uh, so I just want to know, like, just resetting expectations that uh, I have put this pause intentionally because after this, there's a whole slew of slides uh, which might not go well with traditional product owners or product managers. So but do not resign, I mean. Okay. Or, uh, so I just want to know, like, just resetting expectations that uh, I have put this pause intentionally because after this, there's a whole slew of slides uh, which might not go well with traditional product owners or product managers. So but do not resign, I mean. Okay, so what are the challenges that a product owner usually faces in, in any company? Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a startup or whether it's a big corporation. So I will explain what are this, but let's just have a summary of that. It says fears of influence, organizational model, business model validation, ig ignorance and arrogance, right? So 
I think many of us have seen these uh, different circles of planning for agile projects or agile product development, right? So the interesting part is those gray circles. Those gray circles are where the product owners are more effective because these are very tactical, very day-to-day, -day, very uh, hands-on. You are working with the development team, sitting side by side, looking at the backlog, telling them this is the story that you need to play, working with the UX and coming up with the design. This is very tactical. This is very fast. But if you go up to those Drina circles, those are not tactical, those are strategic. And again, the argument is one person may not be a good fit for doing all of this. May not be a good fit. I'm, I'm not telling that you are not a good fit or I'm not a good fit, but it may not be a good fit. It's usually good to have two different people in two different circles because the inner core is very heavy, very uh, interactive, while the outer core, the communication pattern is even different. If you're talking to a CXO, you're not going to talk to uh, a CEO level person the way you talk to your whole team because the way you talk, the materials that you talk about are completely different. So that's a challenge. The spheres of influence is a challenge. And product managers or product owners who are not able to do that, uh, you can identify that easily in your organization. So these are some of the symptoms that you will see. Uh, they will not show up because they are busy talking to the CEO. Or they will not talk to the CEO because they are busy with the engineering team. So anyway, they are absent in some form, either at the top level or at the, like at the bottom levels. And there is limited interaction. Uh, they have too many commitments. Mismanagement of stakeholder expectations because they are not able to move along this, uh, I would say, concentric circles very fast. So they are failing to set the expectations with different people. What they want or what the developers want may not be delivered on time. So let's say I have a sprint uh, scheduled in two weeks. So I want to do a sprint planning meeting two weeks before or one week before. And, but since I'm busy with talking to the CEO or talking and identifying who my market is, I'll not be able to fulfill my sprint commitments. So you can identify that. Has anyone seen this symptom? Like, because I have seen this. Okay. It usually exists, right? Okay. So I'm not throwing things in the dark. Okay, good. So I'm telling that he should not be the only person doing both the sides. I'm telling that instead of having that layer, have two or three people in the middle of which they form a product team. One person talks only to the developers, but that person is maintaining the collaboration with the product team, and some person from within the product team is communicating that to the stakeholders and other. And it can be one person. For a small product, it can be one person. But for something which has like multiple dependencies, upstream, downstream kind of dependencies, it just gets out of hand. Okay. The second challenge is organizational model and culture. Uh, I think this is pretty obvious. Uh, companies either can be pioneers or can be followers. They cannot be both. Right? Flipkart is a pioneer in India, but it's a follower of Amazon. So it. it that way, it's, it can be both. But if you look at it, it's still a follower of Amazon. It's not setting something up new, right? And so that's, there are organizations which strive on innovation. They say that, go ahead, build it, break it, see what happens, and then we'll figure out what's the next step. Uh, because those organizations do not care about stability. They care about more about outcome rather than detail. They do not care about, I need to get six levels of approvals before I allow my developer to create a directory on my machine, on the machine, right? Uh, this is a real experience. So I'm working with this bank for the last eight months, and they give them, uh, the developers, they give them a complete operating system and an environment within which they have to work. They cannot download a new, up, like a new software, like let's say XML Spy, they cannot download it. So they have to go through like three layers of approval before they can download anything. That's stupid, I mean, they're writing your software. If you do not trust them to download a piece of software, they're writing the same software that thousands of other people are going to use as banks' customers. <coughs> Fair. So then you hire responsibly. You do not hire jerks. Um, by the way, this bank uh, 
has the highest installation of open source software in the world in the banking sector. So that's not an excuse. <laughs> uh, team orientation. Somebody said like uh, the buck stops at the product manager, product manager, right? So that's like the individual responsibility, right? You're taking on the glory as well as the failure. You're becoming the single point of failure. You do not want to become that. What happens tomorrow if you win a lottery? I mean, I'm not telling that you can die, die of a truck accident, but I'm telling you can win a lottery. Right? You do not want to be that person. You do not want to be that single point of failure. You want whole team to be kind of thinking about the product and its success and failures. Uh, there is a very good research by, I think, Gartner or Forrester. It's there in the slide somewhere, uh, where they have uh, surveyed a bunch of organizations in retail, pharma, energy, and uh, some other sectors. And they have actually found that they are starting to build these teams, the success of the whole team depends on the success of the product. So if the product is successful in the market, the whole team gets a bonus. If the product doesn't, is not successful in the market, nobody gets a bonus. So it doesn't matter whether you're a product manager or a developer or a tester or a deployment person, like, it doesn't matter. It's, everything is inbuilt in there. Like, so it's, it, they call it a team, and unless the team succeeds, you do not get anything. So you are kind of forced to then do that, do good for the team and not download, which will screw up the team. <laughs> Uh, the last one is, uh, I think it's a little bit dicey uh, because people do not see aggressiveness as a good quality. Uh, but there are corporations I know which, uh, where aggressiveness is viewed as a good quality. Aggressiveness in the sense not in going, up, going and beating up someone, but uh, more in terms of like, I want to explore new things. Do I need to go through seven different layers to get an approval before I can explore new things? Uh, so the company that I work for, uh, there, is a, there is a kind of unwritten law that you can go and do something which is reasonable to you and expect that if someone comes back to you and say that it's not in the policy, you can say that, sorry. And you can move on. You can say that I'm not going to do it again. You can say sorry and move on. But they do not stop you from doing it at the start. You can do it, and if it doesn't, like if it doesn't suit the HR policies or something like that, then they will come and tell you that it's not the right thing, but you can still try. They will not stop you from trying it. Uh, symptoms. Decisions are overridden by other departments and individuals. How many people have seen it? Like the decisions that the product owner takes, somebody else comes in and says, this is not the right decision, or some other department says, this is not the right priority order. Like, how many people, have you seen it, or this is like something cooking up? There is a lot of? So how do you, how do you, how do you negotiate during those phases? Just one thing, I know there are many various ways to negotiate, but this one, like. Yeah, like, uh, I think the biggest uh, influencing factor is convincing their colleagues that they are not going to do it. Because if they are not going to do it, then they will be convinced that they are not going to do it. So if they are Okay. Did you guys hear it? Like, okay. So what he's telling is that as a negotiation technique, he uses the concept of that if I take this decision X, decision and go, let's say, road X instead of taking road Y, then you will get this customer value or this business value from the product and use that as a leverage to say that the other decision is not the correct decision right now given the information that I have right now. Uh, and that's a good negotiation technique. That's just one thing, yeah. Uh, limited or no influence on technology staffing and solution. Anyone has seen that? Like, um, I have seen that multiple times where product management divisions have no control on technology. Please. I mean, it's, it's interactive. I would love that they had tables and they had round tables, that, but this is like a podium sitting, so if you say, speak it loud, that would be helpful. Otherwise, it could even be very mean things, but still, it does happen. 
have you overcome that in any way? So now in order to overcome is again, uh, it is about making them realize the value that if we don't break this silo, this is what we're going to suffer in terms of the business value. So we yeah, take multiple rounds of discussion. Okay. So I'll give you one example how I overcame this last September. Uh, so there is this marketing division, and uh, they have five people, and their success is measured in the same way that I'm speaking, how many products they release to the market, how quick they release to the market, and those products are successful or not. When it comes to the development team and the engineering team, their success is measured by are they on budget, are they on time. It doesn't matter what they build. If they say that the budget is $1 million, and they say they will release in September, those are the two criteria that they are measured on. They're not measured on the product success. So when they're delivering a product, they're telling, I don't care whether your product is a success or not. I delivered on budget. But they do not go and take that step and tell the marketing department that, look, I cannot deliver this because your budget is a constraint or your staffing is a constraint or something like that. And the biggest way, to, like the single most effective way to resolve that was to make them realize that you guys are measured on different things. Why don't you guys start talking and measure, like start come to a common ground where you measured on only one thing, the success of the product. And I didn't know how it worked, but it so happened that uh, the guy who was leading the engineering team, the director, and the marketing director, they went for a lunch, they went for a couple of drinks the next day, and then they got the budget. I'm like, it's marvelous that now you guys realize that you guys are measured not on two different things, but just measuring on, on scope, on time, and on budget is not going to give you the thing that you're looking for because you are not going to deliver a good product if you have time constraints. If you are going to say, like, I need this product by September and I have only two people, then I cannot deliver it. But they will still say it's a success from IT perspective because I have delivered something within that budget. And this is the way things get done around here. I mean, that's pretty popular. But because the budget has been allocated at the start of the year, and you can spend only this much in new products, this much for maintenance. And so whenever I'm doing a new product, I have to finish. I have to be satisfied with that button in that position. The amount of effort that would be needed to put that button on something else maybe cost $10,000 more. But I cannot cross that. That is how IT is measured. Good question, right? So in agile projects, scope evolves. Everybody knows that scope will evolve. And so or you always speak about minimal viable product and like fast release, we'll see how it goes and then we'll evaluate and iterate and things like that. But when the release is gone and the money is gone, uh, then there is no iteration. Uh, that's why always the business tries to throw everything into the kitchen sink and they want to get it done because the moment it's reprioritized, their experience, it will never get done because there is no budget in IT to allocate for that. And that's a problem. That's a very traditional problem in big IT houses. Yes. Exactly. Once the product is finished, it's done. Mm -hmm. Yes. They do not think it as a continuous thing. They think it as an event that happens, and that's it. Uh, this is very interesting. Have any of you seen this before, Business Model Canvas? Uh, this came out of a PhD research by this guy called Alexander Osterwalder. I think he's Norwegian. Uh, so he said for any new product, there needs to be a business model uh, of how your product is going to work, whether it's going to save money, make money, give you eyeballs, raise your brand value, give you security, whatever the heck it is, right? Whatever that value proposition that you are giving that should be in the center, and then all your key resources, key activity, partnerships that you are forming should be on the left, and that will form your cost structure, because these are the things which are going into your costs. 
And on the right-hand side, you have delivery channels, how you're delivering things to your customer, uh, how you're maintaining the relationship. And then you have customers here where you have segmented them into high priority, low priority, and those give you the revenues. And basically, you see whether your revenues could be not dollars. Your revenues could be number of hits I have on the website, number of unique hits or number of repeat visits, things like that. You need not be dollars. And this is very interesting. This is a very simple model to do. And we tried it at one of the client side. And uh, if you see this seven, eight, five, all these things, these are like the priority order. Ultimately, they came to realize that seven need not be done. I changed most of the stuff because it was confidential, but I kept one thing for, uh, it says 2017. So they can live with the product and not have that feature till 2017. Still, they will make money. Uh, it's, it's so interesting. And then they found out that they can just address one customer segment and they will still make money in the next release, which is like after six months, they can go to the next market. And so if you do something like this, uh, when you're starting a project, when you're starting a product, uh, in the morning, Jennifer was speaking about what you do when you start a product, how you start, how you run a workshop with all your stakeholders and kind of build up a roadmap. And as part of that, if you do some kind of validation of whether there is a need for a product like this, how you're going to know that you're going to reach a goal and you will be measured success, right? If you do something like that, then that's a very easy way of knowing whether your product will be successful or not. Yes. But you need to know, you have to, you have to write this as a, like we usually do this as a workshop, get everyone involved and use stickies and flip charts and help them write the things and then ask them, like, can you put a value on this? So it's usually missing. A business model canvas. Alexander Osterwalder. Yeah. So if your business model is missing, uh, have you guys heard of this company? Solindra? Huh? Yeah, yeah. So anyone from US would have heard of, have heard of this company, I'm guaranteeing. Like, uh, this is a company that makes thin solar panels out of non-silicon materials. Uh, and this company became a big controversy because Obama's government gave $550 million loan guarantee to this company and they declared bankruptcy in December. Uh, so basically $550 million of taxpayer money went down the drain. Uh, and they didn't do a business model validation because their cost of production was twice the cost of production of all other competitors in the market. Uh, I mean, that's just a simple thing to do. Anyone who is giving you a loan is supposed to check that, that what's your business model, whether you're going to make money. I don't care whether you make money in one year or five years, but if your cost is double that of your competitors, you're not going to make it. And uh, so they went bust. Uh, one of the reasons that they went bust, they said, was that China came up very fast in manufacturing uh, with non-silicon as well as silicon because the price of silicon went down very fast, uh, which nobody could predict apparently. But I do not buy that, and that nobody could predict that silicon would go down. I mean, but remember that these are not the same silicon that they use for computer chips. These are all the scrap materials that are left after a computer chip is formed. Uh, apparently, the supply of that went so high that silicon, silicon built silicon solar panels became much more cheaper, and so they went down. And I mean, it's a simple business model validation, but they didn't do it. I think the interesting thing is uh, continually delayed launch dates. Uh, have you ever guys had this problem? Conti like you are near the release date and then like, oh, we cannot meet this date. These features are not done. Oh, those features are not done. By the way, the CEO came and said, I need a forum in that website, right? So basically, you are not talking with your stakeholders. You're not talking about your business model. You're not balancing your stakeholders' uh, expectations and that, this is a typical, uh, you have an untrusted product team because nobody trusts them now. Okay. This is an arrogant product owner, right? Like anyone who says that the bug stops at me. <laughs> Kidding, man. <laughs> uh, too much of hand waving instead of reality check. Huh? 
So these are all the anti-patterns, these are all the challenges that I told you. Like if you are a product owner, or if you are becoming a product owner in a big organization, you are going to see this. Uh, you are going to face these problems. One or many of these problems. How to get over this? That's the next part of the slide. <laughs> Well then, the, at that point, go ahead. I agree to that. Yes, I'll come to that point. Definitely, that there is a, a decision by committee, right? Like where everybody has their vote, and then you decide on a thing which is not actually valued. So then your product is not successful. But there is a way to manage that. I'll show you. There is a way to manage that. Definitely. Uh, so if you look at those things, right? Usually, it's the organization that holds you back. It's not you. I mean, those product managers, if you put them in a startup environment, if you put them with a couple of developers and a designer, I was talking with uh, one of my ex-colleagues that we should leave company and we should start a service where uh, we do a part-time gig, we go, uh, we get one UX guy, three developers, two MBAs like me, and we can help clients make products 15 days, come out of it, done, make some money, and we can do that repeatedly year after year, and we can still have our own jobs. I mean, it's in a small scale we can do that. Uh, the moment it becomes large, it's about expectations, it's about hierarchies, it's about layers, approvals, and nobody wants to get into that. You cannot develop good products like that. Uh, that that's just doesn't happen. I mean, you saw all the list of product, all the lists of companies or products that failed in the second slide, and I think day before yesterday, Fast Company came out with a list of 50 companies across the world whom they rank as innovative companies. Uh, and they're just small companies, none of them are big. I was like looking at it and all of them are startups or all of them are like five years old. Uh, the biggest that I saw in there was uh, Debi Shetty's hospital chain, Narayana, Narayana, Ridala, yeah. That, that, that was one of the most innovative companies. I mean, so other than that, all the companies were small. So this is all about the culture, right? So I think it's pretty. How many of you have read this book, Rework? One, two, three. If you have not read it, buy it and read it. I'm serious. Uh, this is one of the best books and a very fast read. It has every like it has advice for teams and product management and project managers. Everyone just one page. Everything is just one page. And uh, this is written by the guy Jason Fry, afraid. Uh, Fred, yeah, he, he's, the man, he's the owner of 37 Signals, the guy who created the base camp. Uh, so it's their book. It's really cool. Uh, so when you talk about culture, right, we talk about these companies, Facebook, 37 Signals, Pixar, Zappos. Zappos actually gives $300 to anyone who wants to leave Zappos. Like that's the kind of culture you're speaking about, right? Like if you do not want to work here, you're more than welcome to go, I'll pay you money, go. I do not want someone who doesn't want to work here, right? Who is not vested to the cause. Uh, Zappos has a story where uh, they delivered shoes. Actually, like uh, some woman was uh, pregnant and she was online and she wanted to buy some shoes and the size didn't fit. She wanted to return it. Since she, she was pregnant, she couldn't go out and return it. They actually sent a customer service guy to her house to pick it up. I mean, that's the kind of culture you speak of, like when you're speaking of customer service. Here I rang up BSNL three times, they never said thank you to me. They never said thank you to me. So that's the difference between product owners in large corporations and startup, and that's not my take. Uh, this guy, Steve Blank, he's a University of California Berkeley professor. Uh, so he says about all these things that usually product owners in large corporations are risk averse. They do not want to take risks because they do not want to piss off people. They do not want to jeopardize their position, so they do not take risk. Uh, on the other hand, companies like Atlassian, 
would be uh, not risk averse. They actually give 20% uh, of their time to build something new, right? Uh, you want to speak about it? I mean, I know you're from Adulation. Go ahead, and speak about it. Yeah, we, uh, well, we allow 20% time for developers to work on anything they want. So it allows, you know, so if you're a product manager, you know, you can work on something that a product manager doesn't assign to you. Um, very likely, this is your own creativity, this is your own ideas, that maybe your product manager doesn't think of. Um, and very usually, those 20% uh, projects become Google works like the same way. Google actually even has an internal marketplace. So let's say you are working on Gmail or you're working on Google Health or you're working on Picasso or something. You can give your time to that and then they put it up in a sandbox and everybody within Google who is interested gets to use it and depending on the volume of interest that they have, they fund the project. So that's, that's like your internal marketplace, like where you want to go and that's a good way. Like if I have too many people telling that I want that feature, I want that feature, Usually there is a good way to put value on that and see what is the volume of that value and then agree on something. I will actually have an example here where I talk of a company where there are no managers. $700 million company. So it's obvious that we have to think differently, right? Look at that. I took this picture, I, I think, from... Uh, what is the developer side that everybody goes, uh, Stack Overflow. Uh, this, this guy is telling that a miracle occurs, right? And you get the right equation or whatever, right? So I'm telling that a miracle cannot happen. Uh, you need to think differently. I mean, you, you should be more explicit here in step two, the miracle occurs, right? <laughs> so that was your question, right? Like it's all negative, negative, negative. How do I overcome this? I mean, I cannot say this, you just do a miracle and it's gonna go away. Uh, and most big, big corporations know that. Uh, most large corporations are aware of the fact that they have the talent, they have the brand value, they have the infrastructure, but for God's sake, they cannot produce a new product like in six months, one year, when there are startups who are producing products like in one week. Twitter was produced in one week. Yep, so what they do? So here, here, here is all the good things that you have to think about, right? Uh, there is this book by Jim Collins called Good to Great. He studied 15 companies over six years. Uh, sadly, Circuit City was one of the company. Uh, he said good to great. At that time, it was great, but within, after five years of that, I think Circuit City went down. Uh, so he says, like, what you are deeply passionate about, what drives your dollar economy engine, and what you can be the best in the world at. And the suggestion is do not be at the edges because if you're at the edges, your success rate is probably going to be, the probability of getting a success is probably low. But if you're somewhere like in the middle of these Venn diagrams, then probably your success is higher. And if you can actually nail it in the center, then you got a winner. You surely got a winner. You have to be passionate about what you're building and it needs to give you some money and you need to have some people who are best in that. Uh, how many of the companies can claim that? How many of the big companies can claim that? I, I don't think most of them care about like, okay, we have like a, we can drive our economic engine and we can be the best in all that. So like, let's say our Tata Motors would be somewhere here. They're good in making cars, right? So they bought Rolls Royce, Jaguars and other stuff. So, so they think about that, but I'm not sure, or maybe they're here because they are deeply passionate about cars, but I do not know because Tata is such a big entity by itself, I do not know how much passionate they are just about making cars. Rather, BMW just make cars. They're really passionate about that. So first and foremost, if you are uh, thinking of making a great product, you have to kind of work around this and see where you fit in. It's very easy to do. You can put this on a flip charts and then put in stickies and see what makes things work. As a result of this, most corporations have started financing incubators and started financing startups. I do not know how much that is prevalent in uh, India because I'm unaware of that, uh, but definitely there is a ton of that happening in US right now, uh, where big corporations like Chevron, Google, uh, Bloomberg, all of them are financing startups or they have their own venture capital funds that they go and sponsor different startups. So here are some examples, right? Uh, the 
I worked with them, they closed out. I worked with them a little bit. And yeah, I think Bloomberg Ventures, yeah, they are there. Uh, so the interesting is that JP Morgan, right? JP Morgan Asset Management. Uh, they know that they cannot do a new product or anything like that, so they invested a ton of money in Jawbone. So Jawbone is a startup that makes those uh, wireless Bluetooth uh, earplugs, or what do you call that, like the, the Jabras, yeah. That's what they make. Microsoft has Bespark where they say like, if you have a startup, they will give you uh, one year of free license for all Microsoft software. Because they expect that if you are successful within one or two years, then you will continue using their product and pay the license fees. But it's a way of kind of promoting because they know that they cannot build fast enough. <sighs> Hire carefully. Do not hire jerks. So th these guys, I mean, I just took their example because I was reading about them. Uh, they hired their first employee after three months because they really wanted to make sure that the first few people that they hire believe in the core values and principles of, of what that organization stands for. Because if they do not believe in that, the rest of the people that you start hiring after that, they're not going to believe in any of the causes. And that's very important. Like whenever you are making your team, you're con constituting a new product, pick the people who matter. Hire people who are really passionate, who are really charismatic, who knows what they're talking about and what they're going to build. Let's see. Nurture cross-functional teams. How many of you use Xbox? Two. Okay, so Xbox is not popular in US, in India. How many of you use Wii, Nintendo? Wii, okay, Wii is popular, okay, fine. So you can change that example to either Wii or Xbox. Uh, usually when you think of someone who is a gamer, I usually think of like dungeons, dark black colored stuff, like sitting in the corner with all the lights off, playing computer, and that's it, right? But when you think of Xbox or when you think of Wii, it's no more like a gaming, it's more like digital entertainment. It's no more just gaming, right? So in order to build that, uh, both Nintendo and Xbox changed their whole team structure. Uh, I know specifically this case study that they have mentioned here, and uh, they had to get permission from Bill Gates, and they broke few walls, they bought industrial designers, they bought uh, brand marketing people, they bought developers, and they bought everyone into that single place for eight months to fix and like to find the product, like what they want to build, how they want to build it, what would be the color of it. Most often than all, Xbox is white, which is very different from what a game, gamer would actually want. Uh, so it, it's, it's really cool. You, should, you guys may download this case study and read about it. It's really cool that how they talk about the things. Question on hiring, okay, fine. then you are in the wrong market, man. I'll give you an example, right? If you want to get married, right? You go to shadi.com, right? Why do you go there? Because you can see other people who have put their ads there or their parents, right? So the market is there. If you expect those guys to come here to you, that's not gonna work. You have to go to the market where it's happening. You have to go to the colleges, you have to go to the universities, you have to go to the meetups, you have to go to the user groups, you will find them. You have to find, and if you find them, you better keep them. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you have to pay money, equity, it doesn't matter, you better keep them. Um, I'll pick on Anu, Anu Ramaswamy. She is work, she's an ex-thought worker, and she's working with a bunch of ex-thought workers, and she told me her experience during, just before the lunch, and I thought that was really interesting. Uh, anu, if you tell it, like two weeks with CV42? Yeah. You have to be a little louder. Just tell me about the two weeks development cycle where you were there and two developers were there and yeah. um, so, 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 so,
last about uh, two years, they probably hired just about 12, uh, 12 engineers. Solid, very high, uh, high engineers, awesome team to work with. Um, I went in to, to, to do uh, a product redesign with them. In two weeks, from start to finish, we had completed an entire product design, had a prototype ready, and that was because uh, of the quality of, of uh, engineers that hired them. One of the examples I think I was giving uh, uh, Anupam was we would we would sketch a few things during the day. We would ideate through different designs. By the end of the day, we would wonder, okay, is this going to work better than this? Sometimes we know just with, with just a paper sketch. Sometimes it actually takes a, a live software to do that. And the developer would say, yeah, I'll just do this in Rails tomorrow. Give me a couple of hours. We'll start our session late. And the first couple of hours next day, we would actually have all the three um, you know, designs done in, in real software, we would come back, evaluate it, go through a couple of iterations with users, and by the end of the day, we actually had like a live working software, which was reusable too, because most of it was raised code that could be used again. And it's just the, it's just the quality of people they had, the commitment they had to, to uh, quick iterations, and, uh, and yes, it's a startup. Um, I haven't seen that quality of people in, in much larger organizations than that have so I'll give you an example. It's an extreme end of the example, but I'm telling you, uh, I live in New York and I go to a lot of these startup uh, meetings. I mentor a lot of people and uh, there's a bunch of people like who are really good. I have my own startup. I failed in one startup and uh, the first thing that I did when I started my new startup was I went to Pace University computer science students. I'm like, you guys want to work in a startup? You can work with me. I, I cannot promise equity, but we'll see what happens. Like, and they were ready to work and they're like really good kids. India is no different. This is Bangalore. This is Bangalore. This is in Bangalore, Chennai, and uh, other places, or Delhi. Like <laughs> that, I do not know, man. I, I'm not going to comment on Hyderabad. Uh, so I think the most impo important thing is like in authority with responsibility. If you're giving someone the power then make him responsible for that decision making. And do not give anyone the power, right? If I give, uh, I still remember when I used to go to the computer lab classes in my college days, uh, there was a main switch and someone was responsible for shutting off that switch when you leave the lab, right? And we would make, we would have fun, like because we know that at that time there was no UPS. So if you put it off, it's gonna switch off the whole LAN. And at those times there was only LAN, there was no wireless, nothing. And so, that was not the responsible person. Like the monitor, the class monitor was not the most responsible person to switch off that thing. Choose your person wisely. This is the company I'm talking of. Uh, $700 million, no one has a boss. Uh, they negotiate their responsibilities with their peers and everyone can spend the money um, and decide on the tools that they need. Uh, obviously everyone knows about the money that they have within their divisions. If they have to hire someone, uh, they decide that there is a need to hire. Maybe like I'm working nine hours for last two months, so that means there is a need to hire someone. Uh, so they will go ahead and hire, and they will interview, not some hiring manager. The hiring manager comes at the end to complete the process. So this is, this is really a cool company. This came out in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, the title was First Let's Fire All the Managers. Uh, his, his reasoning was, the more you have managers, your decision making is slow. And more often than all, if the decision making is wrong, the time, the time taken to reverse it would be slow too. Right? So it's expensive because managers usually get more paid than, uh, let's say, someone like me. Uh, so, and uh, they even said, like, let's say there's a usually a standard, like for every 10 people, there is one manager. Now, let's say there are 100,000 strong organization. Uh, how many managers do you think you need? Uh, he showed actually the number was 1,111 uh, because you need 1,111 because you need 111 managers extra to manage the 1,000 managers that you're creating. So uh, there, there is a charm there, right? So he, he actually sh talked about this company so much that I was impressed. This is based out of South California. Uh, there are other companies which are like this. This is just an extreme example, but you can come to somewhere where there is a moderate 
way of doing it. I mean, where you have groups which decides on what to do. Uh, how many of you have heard of Occupy All Street? Yeah, it, it's a movement, right? But they're very organized, and they do not de decide anything by one person. They usually have something called a general assembly, GA, where, uh, and there is no written documentation. It's all oral, and they decide on something. Like, there is a group called Alternative Banking Group. I work with them. They decide on something, and, like, they decide to move money from banks to credit unions. Once they decide it, they decide it, and they'll go and execute it. They do not need... Uh, other groups' permission to do something because they within themselves know that they have taken a decision responsibly. And that's the faith and trust in the group. If they fail, they fail as a whole. If they succeed, they succeed as a whole. What's the size of this company? Uh, $700 million. So I think about roughly about 800 people, I think. It's a tomato processing plant, the second largest tomato processing plant in U.S. So if I'm eating pizza or ketchup in U.S., I'm possibly eating their product. How many of you have used LegalZoom? I guess yeah, it's there's to form your own company, huh? Okay, so LegalZoom, everyone thinks that they provide legal services online. They do not do that. Uh, they basically hook you up with small-time attorneys and small law offices in several parts of U.S. and the world, depending on your need. And uh, these are really, really small offices because they do not have, uh, let's say, computers or software to do calendar planning and other management stuff that they need. So LegalZoom provides those services to them. And... On the other hand, they provide services to the consumer by connecting them to that, and they take a small fees out of that. But people just think that LegalZoom is providing the service, but LegalZoom is not providing the service. So, and they did that very successfully. They are about $200 million, I think, right now. Uh, and last year, they changed their model and said, we are now going to go into consulting. So now they are charging $15 per month or $25 per month, depending on how long you need uh, private consulting services. So that's a new business model. They didn't come up with the business model on day one, the second business. They, come out with, they came out with something which is very basic. You go and you say that I want to create a new company or I want to divorce or I want to, I don't know, like I want to make a will for my kid. And it's very simple and you can form that and they will hook you up with someone and you'll get it. That's like a primary business model. But the second business model they came up with is like very new and it's making more money for them than the older model. But they didn't drop it, right? They came up with over a period of time, iterating over a period of time. Another good example is Guardian. Uh, I know that because I worked with that project, like that team. Uh, they did a complete overhaul of their website. And like whenever Facebook or Google completely changes their layout, the users don't like it. I still do not like the new look for the Google email. I use the old look. Uh, when Atlassian changes the new look for Confluence totally, there are folks who do not like it because you change the whole layout at one go. Uh, and that's what Guardian avoided. They wanted to do the whole change of the whole site, but at first they just changed the sports section because they wanted to test like what is the response from that section before they go ahead and do across all of the other sites, like uh, all of the other like news and editorial sites and things like that. They chose only the sports section to change. And I think that was a good example because they learned a lot from that. They kept it there. They did A-B testing with three different colors of blue, uh, five different positioning of where they want to put the banner. and things. So they did a multivariant testing of that. And those things are basically types of iteration, right? Uh, they executed on that iteratively and incrementally and then moved on to a new product. Let me see what's going on here. Okay. Okay, I'll explain this on this side. I have never used this, but uh, one of my colleagues have told me that this is something that they have used and it has worked actually. Uh, so let's say this is the value that you get out of a product, and this is the cost that you have. In case of projects which has already started, this is the cost remaining to finish it or enhance it or things like that. So 
if the cost is very small and it's a quick value realization, then it's a quick win. But if the cost is very high and the value is small, they are telling that these are undesirable projects. Don't even start them. This, don't even start them. So this whole area is full of projects and features. You can think of projects, features, programs, anything that you want, products, which are termination candidates. You do not do that. And the key question that I always ask is, like, how do you determine the value? Uh, because that's the key part, right? So a good way of determining value is whether uh, it's a legal issue, whether it's something that you have to do by a certain date because you have committed to some other companies and they're depending on that, uh, whether it's a safety, issue, safety or security issue. So things like that. So if, if those are like high value things that you have to do and the cost is really low, so you start the project right there, start the product right there. Uh, if they are not, they usually fall within this zone. Who will say what is MVP? Go ahead. So, dark question. So, the minimum viable cost. Okay. So, it's a set of features which allow me to go into the market and get early feedback on Perfect. Perfect. So, uh, this is the Lincoln MKZ. Uh, Lincoln MKZ is one of the best cars that, had, that Ford ever had. And, uh, now they do not sell, and they want to become like the Audi and BMW. Uh, so they hired this guy called Max Wolf, uh, who is a great designer. And uh, so when he saw the design last year, this was in 2000, early 2011, I think, uh, he saw the design, and he looked at it, and he said, like, whoa, this is not the right design. If you put this out, this is not going to beat BMW. This is not going to sell. And he, like, scrapped it. They were supposed to announce it in the auto show, in, actually in the... India Auto Show last year, and they didn't announce it. They stopped it because they said that we, this guy said actually like stop the line right there. He said this cannot work because he's the product owner, so he had the say, and he said that this cannot work. He worked on the whole design for a year. They changed the whole engineering, and his key signature is this whole grill, which is apparently will make it more look sexy and make it pricier. Uh, but the biggest thing that he did was during the whole process of developing this car. He took it on uh, test rides. He covered the whole car in like plastics or like stuff that you cannot see the Lincoln emblem or the dis or the logo and things like that. And he gave people who have Audis and BMWs to ride that car. He drove with them and then he did surveys continuously. So every time he would have a viable car that will drive and it will work, or he have added some features to that car that really makes it like a luxury car, he would test it regularly. And that's how he got the feedback that whether this car will work. And they're releasing it in 2012 in the, I think the Detroit Auto Show, March. So MVP is that version of the new product that allows the team to collect the maximum amount of validated learning, which is feedback, uh, with the least effort. Okay, I'm giving a lot of examples. OK. So all these companies changed what they started as. Because the market changed, the demand changed, and they had to change. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive. Uh, who can say, what was YouTube? What was YouTube as? Hot or not for videos. It was basically a dating site, video dating or something like that. Uh, PayPal? Uh, PayPal was used for financial reconciliation between Palm pilots. So people who had Palm, if they wanted to do transactions among themselves, only they can do that. So PayPal was a software called Confinity. Uh, it was called Confinity. Wipro. Oil and soap, right? It's still called West, Western Indian products, or West Indian products, or something like that. It, that's how Wipro is. It's Western Indian products, right? There you go. But you guys still have that emblem. You guys still have this emblem, right? The sunflower, the sunflower oil and the sunflower soaps. Yep, you still have that emblem. 
uh, Lamborghini. It used to be a tractor manufacturer. Lamborghini. Uh, you're right, YouTube used to be hot or not, you're right. Uh, Flickr used to be a chat site, uh, or sorry, Flickr used to be a multi, I think, how, how do they call it, like MMORG or MMOPRG, like multiplayer online large games, that was Flickr. Yeah, that, that was Flickr, and they had a chat service through which you can exchange your photos. So now Flickr is just about photo sharing. Nokia used to make rubber boots. That's how they started. Uh, Groupon used to be a fundraising site. And uh, Groupon became a huge success when there was a pizza company on their floor, um, and they offered discounts for the pizza from their floor because they wanted discounted pizza. So that's... Uh, Twitter was a podcasting company called Audio, O-D-E-O. -E so basically the goal is that if you are a product owner or a product manager, you just cannot say that I have released the product and it's done. You have to continuously monitor the market and change based on what's going on into the market. And uh, if you do not change, more often than all, you're probably going to die. How am I doing with time? I still have 15 minutes, good. Uh, collaborative road mapping. This is really interesting. I still do not know whether I can show it to you guys because I asked my uh, colleagues whether this is confidential or not, but he didn't reply yet, so I'm doing it till he says it was not, and I will say sorry. So, these concentric circles are months, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, 15 months. And these are the different projects in the portfolio. And you have features aligned like that. And anybody can see what your roadmap looks like. Anybody can see what's going on in your whole portfolio. And the ones which are green are the ones which are like approved or estimated or something like that. So if you see the most of these in the inner circles are green and two are red. So basically then you know that this two needs estimation or this two needs some kind of touch point so that you can move those into green because they are really high priority. You need to get them done within three months. So if you do that kind of road mapping, like you, did, you do not need to do it in concentric circles. You can do it horizontally. Like it doesn't matter how you do it, but you need to do it, and you need to do it with everyone. Right? So there is one example where there is an e-commerce widget. There's something which says, uh, I don't know what it says, but they pulled it down, and it says that it should be a part of the new business, and it has a lower priority than that. So you need to involve your team in making sure that they understand what is the product portfolio looks like. And someone said that, uh, that not only the product owner needs to understand, the whole team needs to understand how the product portfolio evolves, how the product evolves. And this is a good example of that. Which one? OK. So this circle is anything that needs to be done within three months. The biggest circle is six months. This is nine months, 12 months, 15 months. And anything other, other than that, you probably do not need to do ever, like, you know. So this is what something is happening right now. The team is focused on this right now. And then for each of these, let's say this is like e-commerce. This is like content management. This is like new business. Let's say this is video. And for each of these, you have a set of features that needs to get done, right? So then you put them on that axis, and that way you can see the prioritization. You can see what needs to be done next. People can see how the product is evolving, how the roadmap is going. And the ones which are greens are really like have a thumbs up from, let's say, CEO level. You have the budget approved and everything, so you can go through that. So, Go ahead. Oh, the red is that it's not yet estimated. The green is that they have been estimated and approved and people have their approvals, but they know that it's, let's say, three months down the line or eight months down the line. And uh, actually, if you look here, that's an interesting... Uh, I think here they have the name of the people uh, who are working on some of this so that you know like, whom to go to. If, like, if there are multiple product lines, whom to actually go to for that. Go ahead. No, man. It just came from a team brainstorming session. There's no name for it. If you want to put a name, I will use it. It's a proprietary. <laughs> well, I, like, I, like, I like the display versus the... 
Yeah. 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 It's a real example. Because they are not estimated. I mean, I come up with an idea. It doesn't mean it gets estimated right there, right? So you have to get the team together and look at it, elaborate it a little bit, and then probably estimate. Yeah. How many minutes? Five minutes? OK, let's go fast. Uh, Servant leadership, I think everybody has heard about this, uh, but the company that's referred here, uh, they had their employer turnover reduced from 17% to 54%, which basically means for them a saving of $20 million, uh, because for each employee, they have to pay $5,000 to hire whenever someone goes away. And uh, this company is the largest carpet manufacturing company in the US based out of Georgia, and all the carpet manufacturing companies are based in Georgia. So let's say in Bangalore, if I leave Wipro, I can join IBM the next day because they're pretty much in the same vicinity, right? So you have to be really aware of that, that if I'm letting my employees go, what is the cost of hiring someone? Uh, again, because there are other IT companies in my vicinity, and that is the only thing you have because in terms of technology, work, I think most companies now have nailed it. They know how to do the work. Uh, it's the people that matters. Okay. Uh, this is how you engage your stakeholders. Uh, since we are consultants, we always say this is the highest priority. So people who have the highest impact on the product and people who have the highest influence on the product. People who will make the biggest bang for the buck from the product and people who have the highest influence on the product. They are the people whom you need to involve every day extensively when you do your, stake, when you do your sprint planning and things like that, or release planning. Uh, but the people who are not important to the product or they cannot influence your product. I mean, there are people who can influence your product, but they are not important. Uh, so for them, you have to involve them to address their concerns. But for people who are not important, you can just keep them informed. That's it. So I'm going to rush through this because I have only like five minutes left. So let's see how it goes. Uh, these are the things that we talked about not to do. Um, these are the things that you can do if you want to. Uh, this is the Forrester research that I was speaking about, high-performing uh, product-centric development teams. And this is from the same report. They show the trend, like how, depending on the company size, who is doing it, who is piloting it, how, many, how much percentage is not even interested in doing it. So there is a huge percentage which are not interested in doing it for large companies, if you see that. Uh, so whatever I spoke of so long, like it's more about people, right? It's, if you look at it, they look like agile principles, right? They are agile principles. It's more people-centered than process-oriented, customer-focused, moving fast, respond to feedback, being self-organized. So usually I try to step away from the word agile because people misuse the word agile in a different, like a lot of different way. They butchered the word agile. Uh, but if you are a good product manager, uh, you can just follow these things uh, within your company. And for each of these things, you can read, and I can lecture you, or you can hire anyone to consult you, and they can help you with this. But these are the things that you need to do if you really want to make a good product manager and a good product. Questions? <laughs> 